And in reality, when that pain began was when my true life started. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to The Lavender Lifestyle. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we are exploring the journey of healing, healing from physical or chronic pain all the way to healing your deep emotional wounds. So if you follow my YouTube, you might have noticed that I've made a few videos about healing as it's been a very prominent topic and theme in my life for the past couple years. I've talked about healing my self-love, healing my body, my emotional and mental health. I've started doing something called the body and brain practice with Wilson, which we'll explain more in the interview, but it's energy healing essentially. And last year I was also invited to be in a documentary called Love Heals. So today I wanted to invite the filmmaker and main character of this documentary onto the podcast to talk about their healing journey and the important message behind this film. So Love Heals follows the journey of Dana, a chronic pain sufferer in search of healing. Her partner, Chrisanna is a filmmaker, and together they travel the country to understand how this ancient principle has helped so many heal and to see what's possible for those experiencing these practices for the first time. So Chrisanna Sexton is the director of Love Heals and has been passionately producing film and video content since she was 16 years old. She's the primary cinematographer for Love Heals and also did all of the editing, audio mastering, and color correction herself. Dana Crochier is not only the producer for Love Heals, but is featured as the main character in the film. Her journey is an inspiring one, full of many obstacles, including two unsuccessful spine surgeries in 2020. While she still experiences chronic pain, Dana has been able to harness the power of these ancient mind-body practices to facilitate continued healing in her body, which has rippled out into every area of her life. So I'm excited to introduce Dana and Chrisanna. Hello, Dana and Chrisanna. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. I'm so happy to have you guys. I love you both. We're so happy to be here. So Thanks excited. for having us. Yes. Yes. So let's start with your backstory because I want to hear a little bit about how you two met and found each other. Mm, okay. Well, I guess I'll share. So when we met, I was actually married to a man. Which a lot of people don't know. It's wild. <laughs> <laughs> so I was married to a man for eight and a half years. We knew we knew each other about a decade. But um, basically the short version is that I was raised very conservative Christian. I knew I was gay at a young age, but I just felt like that would be a one-way ticket to hell. So I knew I couldn't be gay or felt I couldn't be gay. So all my life was a series of decisions trying to make sure that I was worthy of love, really was worthy of uh, God's love was worthy of my family's love. And so part of that led me down a path where I was married very young. And then I just started to feel unrest within. I was like a workaholic and I did not feel happy in my life. So at some point I was like, you know what? I need to start working on myself. I just need to like dig deep and start to heal. Maybe, maybe it's stuff from childhood that's making me feel so unhappy. So anyway, I found this group at church and I started going to it. And the more I healed, the more I reconnected to the part of me that was like, oh, I'm pretty sure I'm gay. Mm. What do I do with that? Was this something that and, was always on your mind throughout your marriage? Um, I don't think it was all. So he was aware. Oh yeah. So I think, it, I mean, I had dreams about being with women mm. that I didn't tell him about. And it was basically communicated as like my sin issue. So it was something that I had worked through, but sometimes things would come up and he just saw it as like, oh yeah, it's just your sin issue. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. So then I'm in this church group and there was one day where I was finally like, I, I can't pretend that I'm not gay. Like I know that there's something in me that I felt most of my life. I know that I'm gay. And I told someone in the group. And then that was the same night that Dana showed up to this church group. <laughs> oh my gosh. So she was not part of the group before that. Right. Oh my god. It was her first night. <laughs> okay. So and it's very divine, the timing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow. And it's really interesting because she only started because she actually left a really like toxic relationship a few days before oh, and she okay. was looking for support. So then we didn't actually connect that night, but I felt very drawn to her. 
And I just thought, gosh, there's something about her. And of course, Dana's version is that she, she thought I was gay and then heard <laughs> me talking about my husband and was like, what is this? Yeah. So anyway, I think the, the interesting thing is that I always had a dream, especially up until that point, I was having this recurring dream of seeing a woman with long hair and I knew I was with her, but I could never see her face. And this was while I was married. And this dream was, it was like the same dream. So then we had this like coffee meetup because the next week we ended up connecting and actually talking. I was like, I have to talk to this person. I feel so drawn to her. So we just had like a, a coffee hang. And as I talked to her, I just felt like it was the first time my soul was talking to someone that we had already done a life with, like I'd already done a life with her. Wow. And at the time I didn't even believe in different lives. I didn't believe in past lives, mm -hmm. but something in me was coming to life. And I was like, I don't know what I need, what I'm going to do from here, but I know that this person is going to be a part of my life, maybe for the rest of my life. Like I just felt uh, very confident that yeah. my soul had connected to something that was sparking life in me. Wow. So Fast forward, I went to a Tony Robbins conference. The more I was healing, the more I was like feeling drawn to her. We became best friends. I go to a Tony Robbins conference. I walk on coals. And as I walked on these thousand degree coals, <laughs> I, something in me broke. It was like all the fear of my life broke. Wow. And I got to the other side and just had this new connection to myself and this new feeling of like, maybe I could do anything. And what, and I had meditations during right. the conference of like what my future could look like. And they always included Dana. It sounded so like you're, I, yeah, you're like undoing all those layers that held you back all these years, right? You're being more of your true self. And I love that for you. And for the listeners, the reason why I want to start with your relationship story is because your relationship is a big part of your purpose. It kind of led you down this path mm. together, right? Of healing and, you know, everything thing we're going to talk about after this. So I, I mean, it, you guys are a duo, right? Mm -hmm. So Dana was Dana. I, now I want to hear your story about your chronic pain journey and a little bit about how Chrisana has been there with you along the way. Yeah, it's been quite the journey because I can actually pick up where Chrisana left mm -hmm. off. So I had been in a six-year relationship with a woman who had two kids. And while it started out fine and it seemed very healthy through time, I started to recognize that uh, it was not what I thought. It, there was a lot of emotional, um, I don't want to, abuse is such a strong word. So I, I, I don't use that word lightly, but it was a very difficult, toxic type situation where what I identified in that scenario is that I was not being true to myself. I was people pleasing and making sure everybody was taken care of, but I was suffering. I felt like I lost my personality, who I was. It was like I woke up one day and thought, I am living this life for everybody but me. And I wasn't even being supported and loved well. And all of that led me to finally making a really difficult decision to cease that relationship. And I go into this group to break the chains of codependency. That's what the group was all about. How do we start walking in authenticity? Who am I? Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't even know who I was anymore. Mm -hmm. So when that happened, that was in January of 2017. And, you know, Chrisanne and I started this beautiful friendship. And by May of 2017, we were like going to the gym together and working out a lot. And I suffered an injury while I was running on the treadmill and it was my calf. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just pulled my calf really bad. I'm sure with just some rest and ice and elevation, I'm going to be fine. And on the contrary, I mean, it started to move into my other leg. I was having more pain and then ultimately up my leg into my like sciatica and then eventually lower back. But it was over the course of what, a couple years. Mm, and it just grew. What's interesting right, huh? too is that same mm. month, May, when the, her pain started, was the same month that I started my divorce. Oh. And so there was a, a few years where I felt like maybe I was the cause, like my life decisions or, you know, me. I don't know. There was a lot wrapped up in that, but it was just fascinating that it was the exact same time. Okay. And uh, continue yeah. the story of your yeah, pain journey. Yeah, but so. what... But what wasn't said is at that same time, my ex started to tell me like, hey, you can't see the kids anymore. You can't see the dogs anymore. So there was a lot of heartache. 
that was happening in general. Mm. And Chrisanna and I falling in love and wanting to be together. I mean, it started out with a lot of shame because Chrisanna's ex was very, I mean, obviously very upset when she came out and, you know, we didn't solidify our relationship until after she was divorced in September of that year, but we loved each other for a long time. And yeah, it was hard. So there was this idea that, gosh, maybe the stress just pushed me over the edge. And I do believe because I know the mind and body are connected, that absolutely plays a role, right. but it's nobody's fault. It needed to happen. Mm -hmm. So I was in pain every day. Um, to be honest, there's been very few days where I haven't felt discomfort in my body since May of 2017, mm -hmm. but it especially got worse as things progressed. And I really did not want to have surgery. Unfortunately, some events that led up to the surgery just had my system in a really terrible place. I was in so much pain and I started to lose, like you couldn't feel the pulse anymore in my ankles and I was losing reflexes and I just started to really decline. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is the only choice that we have in this moment is to go forward with surgery right. before things get worse. And it's you said it started in your calf, but you had to do spinal surgery or... <laughs> yeah. So, so tell me, what, how does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Why does that make sense? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> We wondered the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, what they found on an MRI was that I had a herniation in L5 S1 and that herniation was putting some pressure on nerves that run all the way down okay. your legs into sense. your like I ankles. See. And by that point, the pain had spread actually up into her back. Right. So yeah. it was calf, then it went up to sciatica, then it was in the lower back. And, and were so they you, said, oh, this is just a sign of that nerve. Were you able to walk? Like what, I guess, how were you, I guess, debilitated in your everyday life? Yeah. Walking became problematic. Mm -hmm. Sitting right. for periods of time became problematic. Sleeping. It was like doing anything for too long was really, really painful. So you were probably very desperate to just find very. a solution. Oh my gosh. Right. And I, I was. So I went through all of the medical ways of physical therapy, chiropractic, acupuncture, like anything and everything. And then they finally convinced me to do something more invasive, which was an injection into my spine. And it was maybe one of the most painful, traumatizing things I experienced because I think they either hit a nerve or it was so aggravated that it just it blew it up and it, and things got progressively worse after the injection. So yeah, everything you really that they, couldn't walk after that. It, it, you're saying nothing helped you feel better. It just made everything worse. Nothing helped me feel better. So I went into okay. surgery thinking this really was the last resort mm -hmm. and this is going to fix it. Mm -hmm. And we had also exhausted Eastern medicine too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I what mean, else did you try? We could try? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh -huh. Acupuncture. Yeah. Just so our listeners understand the length yes. that you went. It's funny because I've listed this out a few times. And I know. It's so overwhelming. It was like definitely acupuncture, a lot of energy work. She actually had was doing healing sessions mm. at Body and Brain. Okay. She got really involved at Body so and Brain. So you were already, mm -hmm. you, you found out about that and were healing already. Mm -hmm. that. I found out about it, but I had a few missing links. My mindset was not in the right place to heal. I still had things that were keeping my nervous system in a really, really like upset place. And um, we weren't consistent. No, mm -hmm. I was never. It was really just the like healing sessions, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. just going to try to heal. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't what I know now. And I'm significantly different now, even post-surgery after everything I experienced with the first surgery and then having that injury in surgery of having my, you know, a spinal fluid leak and going into ICU and going through some incredibly painful, not just physically, emotionally. I mean, I literally was hoping to die because they couldn't get my pain under control in the ICU. And, you know, looking back, it's like, if I did not go through all of that, if Chrisanna and I didn't, I mean, go through maybe the darkest moments of our lives together and individually during that time, <laughs> Love heals wouldn't exist. Right. It's, it's, I know it's challenging, but like every challenge has a purpose, right? It does. I, I just want to add, because uh, I, I do want to answer your question. We started seeing a woman, so a lot of Eastern modalities. Oh. There was a woman who like specialized in nerves and using energy to help heal nerves. We would drive an hour each way 
and spend, it was like $200 a session. We did that for, I think, six months. Mm -hmm. I mean, every extra penny we had was going Mm -hmm. towards these healing set modalities. So healing sessions, body brain, healing sessions with her, Mm -hmm. acupuncture. And then there was also this like experimental therapies that she did with like electro electrodes and putting electricity in the body. It's called a scrambler. And it was supposed to rewire my brain because pain is actually processed in our brain, right? We feel it in our body. Mm-hmm. So I was re-scrambling my brain and it was so awful and painful oh, and, more pain. and didn't work. <laughs> it's, it's tough because uh, I think there's so many healing modalities and some things work for some people, but it's mm-hmm. it, it, there's not really a guarantee for a lot of things. And I guess at this point, I want to let the listeners know if you guys have missed my previous podcast where I have talked about this, like Wilson, my boyfriend also deals with like chronic migraines and it's something that's been happening since 2015 end of 2015. So we in our personal life have also gone through the journey of seeing a bunch of different doctors, Western and Eastern, neurologists, allergists, like acupuncturists, there's all these different things. He was doing, you know, they prescribed him like multiple pills to take a day. There was something called Amovig. It's like this shot that you stick in your leg for your migraines. Like you give it to, it just didn't make sense to me, right? He had to shoot himself in the leg. He got Botox in his head. There's so many things that he tried and it's still like nothing gave him definitive answers like no diagnosis Mm -hmm. just there's so much gray area in medicine right that it's I don't know we're we're still in that place and that kind of led us both as a couple to body and brain as well because if he wasn't going through that I wouldn't take this type of healing practice as seriously you know I would just go about my life but I think everything does have a purpose where, yes, it's Mm. super challenging, but it's guiding you to somewhere you're meant to go, something you're meant to learn. (sighs) I know. So I so feel that. Yeah. I I feel that because it's like, unless something's, so for me, similar, unless she had this experience, I I wouldn't have started all of these alternative methods of healing. And yet I didn't realize how much I needed it. I would just be functioning. Exactly. (laughs) Like it it helped me release and and heal so much personally. Um, At this point now I want to ask Dana. So what do you feel was the missing link? Because I feel like in that time since the surgery and everything, like something clicked, right? You found something that gave you hope. And what was that? Yeah. So there was not one silver bullet per se, But what was happening, even though I was doing some of these modalities, and especially when we started filming for the documentary we created, I was starting to see some really incredible practitioners um, in the practice. And, you know, I, I think part of what I was missing really first and foremost was mindset. I felt like a victim most of the time, like, how could this happen to me? What Mm -hmm. happened to my life? How am I ever going to get through this? And when you have that victim mindset and you want to be somewhere other than you are in your life, your nervous system really can't ever settle down, which is required for our bodies to have that environment it needs to heal. I just was not in a good place mentally. So I think finding that um, peace within me during this process was one of the most important things that could have ever happened. So while I might be doing these practices and I'm like, gosh, I don't feel any different physically. What was happening was I was releasing some really old traumas and things that I had within my body that have been stored there probably for decades. And I wasn't going backwards and looking at things and releasing emotion about things that were really difficult for me. Multiple ways of being abused throughout my life and then suppressing that. So there's a few things that really hit home for me. One of them was starting to, I don't want to say journal because it's more than journaling. Mm -hmm. I started to do what I call expressive writing. And it was releasing all of these things in me and saying things on paper that I would never maybe even say out loud that I just needed to let go of. Writing a letter to my body I mean, doing things, I I had to literally become friends with my body. And in the practice, that was the first time I'd ever said, I love you to Mm -hmm. myself or to my body. Mm -hmm. So I was missing self-love. I was missing the fact that the answers really were inside of me instead of outside of me. And the fact that I really needed to take into consideration the emotional factors and how much 
I was such a perfectionist throughout my life, which doesn't keep your nervous system in a very mm-hmm. settled place. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I was always striving and trying to be good enough and not recognizing that I had a lot of hurt and anger and things that just went unexpressed for a really, really long time. Mm-hmm. And as I started to do more and more of those things, like I could feel my system starting to relax and then learning more of the energy balance and being consistent in a daily practice where I would, you know, do expressive writing, meditation, breath work, energy balance in my body. But the fact is getting into my body and movement and movement. Mm-hmm. We like to, I mean, well, for you were so, scared. For oh my so God, I was terrified. Move. I was living my life in fear, which also does not help you heal. So, you know, getting into my body as much as possible and knowing that I'm safe. Yeah. Once you have a level of safety, things can start to shift. Wow. So within the last few months, I feel like a completely different human. Do I still suffer with some pain? Absolutely, but not the same way. And I had a few days of, I would say, 95% relief, which is like, Wow. Brand new for me. I so really want to highlight this to our listeners. I know you talked about a lot of things and, and all of these mm-hmm. are so important. And I feel like it relates to people who don't even deal with chronic pain. We all hold so much emotion and pressure on ourselves within. And it's not until something forces you to look at it, right? And start to release it. Because your body in its natural state, when you're relaxed and calm, it knows how to regulate itself and heal itself. But I think a lot of us block ourselves from that ability because we're always stressed. We're always trying to be a perfectionist. We're always, there's so many things where mentally we're, you know, striving or trying to, I don't know, we hold ourselves back in so many ways. So I I thank you for sharing all of those things. So Mm -hmm. I, I also, you know, before we brush over it, I want you guys to kind of, how do you explain what exactly you're doing in the body and brain practice? I know it has to do with movement and affirmations, but how, how, I want to hear, how do you explain it? Do you mean like to our family and friends who don't know what it is? (laughs) Because I'm sure most of our listeners don't know. Yeah, I love to call it energy yoga. Ooh. It's actually something I've been telling them. Like, I feel like this is, you know, people have a preconception of yoga. So if you just put energy before it, it opens it up. Honestly, that um, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually glad you like it because <laughs> I needed yoga. something. For a while, it was like, is it Korean yoga? But that doesn't mean anything to me. I know it's based in Korea, but the practice is so much more than just where it's from. So, yeah, to me, it's, it's just energy based. And while they bring in all these practices that maybe if you went to one center just for that one practice, there would be more specialty there. What I see it as is a holistic approach to all of these ancient practices mm-hmm. that personally I want access to all of them. And so they bring it all together in one place. And not only that, but then you're guided by someone who isn't just showing you poses, but who's actually invested in your journey. Yes. So there's a therapy element too, right? Yes. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I would explain it a little different. All of that is true for me, but the thing that it does for me is brings me home to myself. Mm. If I could summarize it, it's like it brought me back inward where everything else felt like I was seeking outside of myself. So Body and brain and these energy practices are so critical so that we can remember who we are. It helps us move forward into a more authentic life and keeps me in a space where I'm not so driven by emotions Mm -hmm. and I'm not reacting anymore. It's like I'm centered in my home within myself. Mm -hmm. And I just, I know, you know, yoga and all these different modalities, they have great benefits But the other thing that Body and Brain incorporates is exactly in the name. They really fully understand the mind-body approach. Mm -hmm. And it's like everything from stretching and yoga to breath work to meditation. And most recently, I can tell you what has been very impactful, not just for me, but Chrisanna too, is vibration and shaking. Mm -hmm. So we know that when animals are in the wild and they go into fight or flight, after that threat is gone, they actually, there's videos of this. They shake shake their bodies. They shake it out. I have an image of Togi. Like sometimes he just shakes it out. (laughs) 
Dogs do it very yes. intuitively. Oh. They do, but humans oh, so don't. That's a we think disgusting we... thing to just shake yes. your body a little bit and get the tension out. Wow, I didn't that's think right. about that. Okay. It's helping us immensely yeah. to do like body and brain. I think every Friday they have vibration classes that you can actually... Which terrified me at first. <laughs> I did one and was like, I'm never doing that again. I loved it. <laughs> but I didn't understand the benefits. And I then see. now it's like we've, we were baby stepped into it. Yeah. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel like a different human just mm-hmm. moving that way. Wow. Even though someone might see that and say, oh, that's totally weird. But yeah, it's wow. really... I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> I love I know, it. I love that you brought that up. I, I've tried a little bit too, but I guess I'm sure you guys have gone deeper. Um, another thing I want to add to what you guys said to our listeners is it, it is really a practice that brings both the mind and the body together. Because I feel like in Western practices, like we know yoga, we know like... I, like we keep everything separated, like, oh, this is physical. And then these things are for your mental health, right? You do things for your physical health and mental health separately. And this is really a practice where you're doing both at the same time. And I, I know traditionally yoga is supposed to be a holistic practice, but in the West, we've kind of just focused on the physical side of it. Mm-hmm. So, so I think, you know, this, we're really moving towards more seeing that it's all connected <laughs> rather than let me just compartmentalize all these little things. I would absolutely agree with you on that. Oh, yeah. And the last thing I want to add is, and you, you would see this in the film that we created, when you start tapping physically into your body and working on the physical body and starting to create energy flow by tapping on certain areas, it helps with your circulation. What it also does is helps you uncover and tap into deep stored emotions. Mm-hmm. So I would also add that as we're looking at this practice and you're tapping and you're doing all these different modalities, it's like, it's, it's impossible not to address the emotional and mental and all of that side of life. It's, it's just happened so organically. Mm-hmm. It's one of the things I love. Yeah, about it's this. true. After a while of tapping, I'll just start crying. Yeah, like, that was how oh. I, I experienced that too in the beginning. And that brings another topic that I, I've talked about on my YouTube channel as well. But like your emotions are stored in different parts of your body, right? And we usually don't recognize it. Do you want to speak a little bit about that in, in your personal experience? Mm, I have examples, but I'm yeah, curious. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was at a retreat recently. And I love retreat settings because it's so immersive. I'm not like trying to do a quick class between working and something else, right? You're in Sedona in this case is where I was. And I was actually tapping like- Are you talking about the wellness retreat? Yeah. Sedona wellness? Sedona Um, wellness. (laughs) At Sedona Mago. Yes. 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 Such a magical place. But I was doing tapping and I was just like, yeah, I'm creating circulation, creating an open heart. It was like my solar plexus. And all of a sudden I had this rage that I, I mean, I don't get angry. I, that's my badge of honor. I'm always, regardless of what is happening, I don't show anger because I don't feel angry. I just have compassion. And all of a sudden I was tapping and I felt like I could just rip somebody's head off and I couldn't, I'm like, Which who is, is scary this? Because you're very strong. <laughs> I am strong, but I'm also very gentle. Yeah, like I'm a very yeah. gentle natured you human. So that. I kind yeah. of like, it felt invigorating and empowering. And I was like mad and I was crying, but it was like tears of anger mm. for the years of my childhood where I could not stick up for myself. Mm-hmm. And oh my gosh, I went to Chrisanna afterwards and was like, I found something that was buried so deep within me. And I wasn't, I couldn't think my way. It wasn't a thought process. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'm going to think about all the things that make me angry. No, no, I'm going to tap on my body. And all of a sudden this is going to emerge from anger you've suppressed for so many years. Wow. And I had actually, we had had conversations where I was like, where's your anger about all that you've just been through with surgery? And I'm like, there must be anger there because I'm angry. And she's like, no, I'm not angry. I feel fine. I'm not angry. (laughs) (laughs) Like you've just been trained to always be perfect and fine. And totally. 
Wow. Yeah. yeah. And peaceful. Mm. Very peaceful. Where anger is like my superpower. So. <laughs> I love that. Got it. I can tap into <laughs> her anger. Can you emotions. get angry about this? Right. The, the, the lesson is you le- if you feel emotions, you have to let it out. If you keep it in, it's going to get stored somewhere. That emotion is raw energy. It, it's going to get stuck somewhere. Okay. That brings me to the documentary. Let's talk about how this documentary came to place. How did it happen? Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So I had been filming parts of our journey, not everything. I think what's, what some people don't know is that there was a lot of sacred moments that I knew I would never put on camera or never like pull out a camera. I, and I don't know, yeah. it just felt too, too dark or too mm-hmm. heavy or too sacred or something. Were you so, filming? already with the intention of doing a documentary or were you just filming just to document in the beginning? Yeah. I didn't know what would come of it, Mm -hmm. but I just, because we had been on this journey so long, I thought there's something here. Mm -hmm. I don't, and I had actually, since I was 16, I'd always wanted to make a feature documentary. And at at this, that point I had done like a short documentary, 20 minute film. And so, yeah, I just felt like, I don't know what will come of this, but I feel like there's something here and maybe at the end I'll put something together, even if it's just for myself. So that was interesting because I just had been compiling footage on hard drives and hadn't really looked at it. And then we got to a point where Dana had met with her surgeon early last year and he finally released her to do yoga again uh, because she wasn't allowed to do anything for a year. So oh, wow. we had stopped body and brain. She had to, was doing like some light Qigong and just what she could, but he said it, it was too risky. So we literally just been released and that was very exciting. So we were like, oh, wow, we can start doing some classes. And then I think within a month, I got a call from So Hyung, who's the other producer, saying, hey, we'd like to talk to you about a documentary, see if you might be interested. So the timing was very interesting. And did she know like, you have been filming things? No, oh, no. She okay. Didn't. She just knew that you were a filmmaker. That's it. Yes. Oh, well, and I had done some work with them. Right, right. So prior to that, I just did the body and brain promotional videos. Maybe a year before that, I did the Sedona Mago promotional videos. So I was connected in that way of like helping out when they needed it, right. but uh, still fully running my own company. And I think that Sohyung had knew about our journey, but at the time the documentary wasn't supposed to have anything to do with Dana. That mm-hmm. wasn't the intention. The intention was how do we create, uh, Il Chili wanted to create a film to really share about the power of energy balance. So we had like a whole treatment they had written up and then I wrote like a separate treatment and none of it included Dana. It was like traveling the world and talking to different people who've healed themselves and just trying to share this ancient wisdom. And so what was interesting is we were about to go meet with Il Chili for the first time about the film. And I was in meditation and I had a very clear download that Dana was supposed to be in it. Mm. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh, I can't (laughs) go to this meeting and be like, hey, I think you should have my girlfriend in this documentary. (laughs) (laughs) So it was very interesting because I was like super nervous and hadn't met Il Chili. And I know that you've met, you have met him and I just didn't know what to expect. And he walked in and immediately I felt peace. I just felt like, oh, this is like my family. This is like, a I don't know. He just felt so loving. Uh So anyway, uh, as we went into the conversation, he really wanted to know more about Dana. Mm. And we didn't talk about the film for, I don't know, the first hour and a half. He just wanted to hear about Dana. He heard more about her story. He heard about mine. And then he was just like, I just want to be able to help you, Dana. And so it was really beautiful, this exchange. And then at some point he said, Dana, I think you're supposed to be the main character of the film. No, he didn't say, I think. He was like, Dana, you're supposed to be the main character of the film. That's amazing. (laughs) So he had the same download that you did. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Which just was all the confirmation I needed. Cause I had some hesitation. Like, mm-hmm. is this the right opportunity? Is this something I want to be working on? I just was unsure. And then when that confirmation happened, I was like, okay, we're on the same wavelength. So I know that this is something that we're supposed to move toward, but we still, I wasn't, I never even planned on being in the film myself mm-hmm. until maybe two months before it was completed. So I probably would have filmed things differently, <laughs> but like what I felt was happening all throughout the filming was we weren't It's almost like I was only being given what I needed to be given for that time so that I could stay in the present. And then the film evolved into its own energy 
toward the end. Yeah. So I know that's more than You're you like, asked okay, for, but that's I, how I'm it came I'm curious to about the process because when you set out to make the documentary, do you know like the ending or the kind of the result or, you know, do you know what I mean? I like, do you th- yeah. are you creating yeah. it for this goal or do you just kind of explore? I would love to give my uh, version of that briefly. <laughs> Because when I found out I was part of the documentary and I'm on this healing journey, I mean, I was still in kind of the beginning stages of it. We would talk like, oh my gosh, do I have to, he- I have to heal. <laughs> oh, there's like, a pressure I have again. To- yeah. So then. <laughs> and I was like, no, that can't be because I knew enough at that <laughs> yeah. point that I knew if she had that pressure, then there was no healing was going to happen. Right. So we decided at that point, I just needed to stay present and what they were teaching, like what this ancient principle of water up, fire down teaches, I thought, you know, this is only going to help me. So regardless of the outcome, we, we actually at the time, and maybe I will let you speak to this, but we didn't know what the outcome was going to be because the documentary is a very authentic journey that we took together to seek and find out Like, what is the deal with this principle? And then speaking to experts outside of the practice to say, what do you know about this from a scientific aspect about energy and how it can help us heal and all of, and self-love and just all the things that we uh, were seeking to understand. And through that magic happened. Wow. So go ahead. Yeah. I think that was my biggest angst is that I didn't I couldn't see the outcome. Mm -hmm. And in meditation, the message I kept getting was that I'm not supposed to Mm. because I really just needed to embrace and film whatever felt true and authentic in that moment. So even talking to the experts, those were people that Dana sought out for herself Mm -hmm. and and they were guides for her. So Mm -hmm. then we were able to speak to them for the film. Um, Even the idea to do a retreat was Dana's idea. She was like, well, what if we have people to try this out for the first time and see what's possible? So everything was kind of scheduled organically. And then we had people submit their stories to us from around the country. We filmed way more stories than we could even include in the film. Wow. And so we're hoping at some point to be able to release those separately because so many people have been impacted by this work. Um, but it, it was really amazing because we just kind of woke up every day and we could see the next few weeks or the next month or two. And then these, these serendipitous moments would happen and we would say, oh my gosh, we have to go film that right now. Yeah. We just have to go. I love that. And some of those moments are in the film and some of them are not. So <laughs> I love how authentic. It's really amazing. Yeah. I love how authentic this process is. And I, I'm very curious, uh, can you give us some de- like examples of moments that didn't make it into the film that still <laughs> felt very, you know, impactful to you? Yeah. So this, this one, we have to do something with it. Mm -hmm. But basically we were at a place called Sedona Healing Arts, which there's a Yolesa from the film. It's her place. And, uh, we were just talking to Yolesa. She's a psychic. And I was looking at some art on the wall and I said, who's that? Like, who did this art? I felt very drawn to it. And Yolesa was telling me who it was. And so then I shared with the other producer, I said, I'm just, there's something about this, this art. I, I can't get enough of it. And the other producer, So Young, she's like, oh my God, Manuel, she's coming here today. She will be in Sedona today. She's from Korea, oh. but she'll be here today. And then I'm like, I feel very drawn to her. And so we were is like- she also what? in the practice or? She is. Oh. So Manuel is one of the five de Sansonim. So under Il Chi Li, he has these women throughout the world right. who are basically like extending the practice. Right, right, right past him, Mm -hmm. like creating this legacy. And so she was, I think the original, no, I don't know. I don't know know the specifics, but basically she, um, is like a religious leader in Korea. Mm -hmm. So she's not directly tied, but she's taken the practice and kind of created her own movement with it. Mm. Very beautiful. But people wait for hours just to hug this woman, like hundreds (laughs) of people wait in line. And I didn't, I didn't understand it till we met her. Uh. And I had never felt this like pure unconditional love as free flowing. So anyway, we heard that she received her enlightenment in shaman's cave. She spent, she did 21 day uh, training and then had five days in shaman's cave in Sedona. So we were like, let's just film her story there. Mm. So we did this whole like adventurous filming. So you're saying she has her own break off episode. (laughs) This episode on her. And it's amazing. (laughs) And that didn't make it into the film. Right. It didn't, but there's some really profound things that happened. Mm -hmm. That was my first real hike since surgery and shaman's cave. There's like 
this area that is off the side of a cliff, essentially. And I had a panic attack and Chrisanna caught, I've never had a panic attack before in my entire life. My heart was beating out of my chest. I felt like I was going to fall off the mountain. I couldn't trust my legs because I just hadn't built up the strength yet. I had so much atrophy in my body and Manuel, this person whom I can't actually speak with because she doesn't speak English and I can't communicate with her in Korean. We had the most magical moment that was captured on Chrisanna's drone. <laughs> Nobody was with us. Uh-huh. So I'm off the side of a mountain yeah. and I can't breathe. And she like scales back over to me and we look in each other's eyes and she puts her hands on my heart and she could ju- I could feel her giving me the most loving energy just to help me calm down. Mm -hmm. And eventually they could, the group that was not with us was like, I think Dana actually needs some help. So they get me into the cave eventually. But it was like one of the most magical moments because she said she was so nervous to be on camera and to tell her story of her awakening in this cave. And she said, because of what happened, it like completely broke down all of her barriers and walls. And it was just like, the most authentic raw conversation between her and I with the translator, of course, Mm -hmm. to tell our stories. Mm -hmm. And on film, it's so beautiful. She did an energy dance in the cave that would like blow your mind, but none of that is in the film. I actually, I did an edit of it. I tried to fit it and it didn't quite fit because at the time we were making the film more about Sedona and then we realized it couldn't be limited to Sedona. It was so much bigger than Sedona. So anyway, it's okay. That sounds like you should put it out in some other form. And I mean, just hearing that one example, I'm sure you have so many stories similar to this that you can tell, but I guess as a whole, how did creating this documentary change you? (laughs) <laughs> you know, and, and I also want to know how you got to the title <laughs> Love Heals. Like it's, oh, I'm sure it's all connected. I feel like we should talk about how we got to the title first. Okay. That's a nice segue. Yeah. Can you share about that? Yeah, we actually were trying to figure out the title and came up with so many different things throughout. At one point it was, you know, just the water up, fire down film that was going to be called The Golden Principle. And then it was like Seeking Sedona when Sedona was part of it. And then it just kind of manifested into Love Heals through a conversation that happened with like a a person who actually helps with the books, works for the publishing company. She like oversees Ilchi Lee's publishing mm -hmm. company for all of his books. Right. Right. And so So Hyung was explaining like what the the film film was about. (laughs) And we were trying to telling her we were trying to come up with the title. About self-love and self-healing. And she's like, right. So Love Heals? (laughs) I guess she was like, very talented with words. That's, oh, that's what well, she does. funny is, yeah, when she heard that we picked it, she was like, I mean, I wasn't being serious. You could, you could pick anything else. That's it was hilarious. just an idea. And we're like, no, it's no. magic. It's a beautiful name. It's magic. Yeah, <laughs> it's magic. Um, but what's fa- the reason I say that's a nice segue, because the biggest impact for me was when I was deep, deep into editing. So probably November, I just could not see how I was going to get this done, but I knew it needed to be done by the end of the year. And we all felt strongly like the world is in in a place where it needs this message now. Mm -hmm. So I was pushing so hard, 14 hour days, not taking a day off. And at some point, something started to happen in me where I realized that I did not love myself. (sighs) And, or there were parts of me that were still very much in me that don't love myself. So that was a really um, intense thing. And I, I kind of processed it in that time and then was able to finish the film. And then recently we just finished 42 Days of Training with Ilchi Buko from Sedona Mago. And it involved a lot of tapping and, you know, going inside every day. And then it came up for me again, just like two weeks ago. And I had this strong awareness, like, oh, this is something that's been in me a long time. And I've had to reconcile that I have this programming of childhood to hate myself mm-hmm. because I was taught to hate gay people. Wow. I was taught that yeah, gay it's, people it were went very sinful. deep. Basically. Yes. Wow. And so that has been really interesting because then I was like, oh my God, I just created a film called Love Heals and I'm struggling with loving myself. Mm-hmm. Is there something wrong with me? And mm-hmm. I just had to reconcile like, this is all part of the process. Yeah. Creating the film is also part of my healing journey. Oh, yeah. And I can now, at, and in this place, say I'm, I'm in process and I'm still uncovering those layers that fe- are like this inner child that needs a lot of support. And she needs to know that she's loved for who she is, mm-hmm. not just because of what she's accomplishing or what she's, yes. you know, the award she's getting oh, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so 
Yeah. I think that's like the biggest thing is, is uh, having that awareness. Mm -hmm. And then now I have the tools to work through it. And now I have moments of like, Oh yeah, I like myself. I love myself. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you oh, for that's sharing that, Chrisana. I mean, first of all, all of our listeners, Chrisana filmed and edited that entire documentary and did audio mm. and lighting. It's a lot of work. I really, I'm so proud of you. I, I applaud you for doing that. And I, I love that you shared that because it shows that the healing journey is, never ends. There's so many mm. layers, even though you made this whole documentary about self-love and healing, like we, you know, there's still little things to continue healing and the journey continues. What about yes. you, Dana? You actually took my punchline. <laughs> that is that is my exact learning. Ah. <laughs> is that the healing journey is just that. It's the destination is actually the journey. So mm -hmm. I thought, and I say this in the film, but I really truly believed in my heart of hearts that my life was going to begin when that pain was gone, mm -hmm. when it ended, when I could say, oh, I'm pain-free and now I can really start living a life that I love. And in reality, when that pain began was when my true life started because it made me turn inward. It made me go deep into the places that I had never uncovered before. And I was just, my life was just fine before that. I had a great job. I was making six figures, working from home. I worked my way up. I was very proud of myself, had a nice home. I mean, have Chrisanna, everything was great, but... I had not actually done the work inside mm. that was required. So my body at some point was like, we can only do this for so long. We can only store these things for you for so long mm -hmm. before something's going to break. Oh my goodness. And yeah. it broke me. Oh my goodness. And breaking was the best possible thing that could have ever happened to me because I found myself, mm. the real self that I knew lived within me, the soul self of Dana was in there just aching mm -hmm. to be acknowledged mm -hmm. and, and really loved. Mm -hmm. I did not love that part of myself. So as I was going through this documentary and the healing journey and the retreats and the practice and everything I was doing, I was healing deep parts of myself. So my recognizing the fact that this journey is something that is ongoing because, you know, so if I have a, a few days with no pain or less pain, I might have something occur in my life that is causing me some emotional pain. You know, we're, we're not on this planet to just be comfortable. I've yes. recognized. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we're not here to be comfortable the best or version. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> life is None not meant that. to be perfect. And no. I, when you speak about your life before and after the pain, I, it really it reminds me of Wilson, right? Like you're young, mm. you think, you think you're invincible. And then all of a sudden something breaks and you just can't wait to live your life again after the pain is gone. But that's, that's not what it's about. And so mm. can I share one more oh, learning? Sure, sure. Yes, she reminded me. So by, I think a huge thing that happened for me last year that feels uh, very critical for me is that I released my attachment to the outcome mm. of her journey. Ooh, and yeah. I had to face that fully in wanting a completed film. I wanted an ending and I didn't know what the ending was and actually really wrestled with what to do for an ending. And I only in meditation did it come to me, but uh, because I thought, well, wouldn't the perfect ending be that she feels better or mm -hmm. she's having a few days of no pain. And anyway, so it was very interesting to just like release my attachment to that. And I had this moment of awareness where after Dana's surgeries, things were so dark for so long that we started doing a lot of meditation and we would meditate. I had this vision of Dana on top of the mountain and just like yelling, just like having, you know, so full of joy and it was because she was able to hike again. Mm. And that was everything, like yeah. her being able to hike again. But in my vision, I thought it, w it meant she was out of pain. Oh. And I recently was on a walk with Dana and I said, oh my God, at some point that vision came true and I didn't even realize it. Right. it we're already there. We've been there for a long time. But it's like, 
I had to release my need for it to be a certain way right. to just yeah. embrace and find joy in the present. Mm-hmm. And then it was already happening. It was already unfolding. I love that. So Dana, I'm sure there are other people who either relate to you. I guess I'm going to ask you both the same question because you have different perspectives. So what is your best advice for people who are going through this journey, this chronic pain journey? Hmm. Stop trying so dang hard to heal. Mm. I became very, I don't know, just hyper vigilant about being on this journey and doing things perfectly and trying to heal so much so that I was missing the point. I was really missing it. And the more that I accepted where I was, not accept the fact that I'm living in chronic pain. Of course, that's very difficult. I can't just say, oh, I'm happy with that. That's not authentic. That is not true. But what is authentic is saying, I can have compassion for myself right now. I can love myself through this as I would a best friend or a partner or someone in my family that I love dearly. Why do I not deserve that same thing from myself? And when you start to love yourself and have compassion for yourself in that way, And you just start to accept like, okay, well, I'm not able to hike a mountain today. Here are some things that I can do to bring myself joy or to feel connected to my body and not treat it like an enemy because our bodies are not our enemies. They're giving us a signal that something is off and it needs our attention to go inward with love and compassion, not with anger or separation. It's like an invitation to finally go inward and start to ask the questions like what are what is this trying to tell me what is out of balance in my life is it a relationship that i'm in that i know deep down i shouldn't be in and my body is screaming at me is it a job that i'm working that is like soul sucking and i'm losing balance in my life is it stress low level stress that just builds and builds and builds like go on the journey go on the journey and have compassion and love for yourself And when you do that, everything can change. Everything will change. Wow. Yeah. I love that. And now for Chrisanna, what do you have to say for people who are dealing with, you know, wanting to support a loved one going through this kind of journey? Hmm. Yeah. So I think it's always easiest for for me if I just share my personal experience instead of like, here's the message to you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So in my experience, I think the best thing that I did for myself and I still have to work on is remembering that the person that I love and care about who's in chronic pain, it's her journey. This is her journey. And while we might be walking it together, I actually am only responsible for myself. I have to walk my own journey. Oh, yes. And a small piece that I won't, I won't live here. I won't go here too far, but, um, my ex who I was with, he was also struggling with some re- like serious chronic illness stuff. And I didn't show up as well back then. I became very codependent. I took ownership of his journey because he was unwilling to fi- fix himself in my mind. That was the mm-hmm. way I thought. He's not willing to fix himself. I need to fix him. Mm-hmm. So this is, this is like, I felt like I've my second there. try. <laughs> I've definitely yeah. been there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I felt like this is a, another chance for me. And in, of course, we like have an amazing therapist and we see a spiritual mm-hmm. intuitive. And I'm always working on this for myself. But like, if this is Dana's journey truly, and it's not my job to tell her what pills to take or not take, and it's not my job to tell her what to try, mm-hmm. I can lovingly support, but then actually go within and say, so what do I need to do to caretake me? Mm. What do I need to do to meet my own needs? And, and then have communication about it. What is this an area where I'm feeling unsafe because I'm unsure of our future or whatever? It, it be, I don't know. It just became this thing of like, if I go inside, then we can have really clear communication. That's not this codependent. Um, our life is only going to be better once you're well, which is way too much pressure. Right. And that's a situation I wouldn't want to be in. So Yeah, I think just releasing the outcome and Mm -hmm. doing what I need to do to take care of myself Mm -hmm. is the best thing. Mm -hmm. And it's still like a work in progress because I'm such a caretaker and I just want to help and I just want to be there for others. Um, But that's my journey of self-love. Exactly. It's so much easier for me to take care of someone else. I think for a lot of people, a lot of people can relate to it's easy to give love to the people around us, but it's hard to give love to ourselves when we really need it the most. 
So mm-hmm. I, I love that you, like that answer was something I didn't quite expect, but once you say it, I'm like, okay, yes, definitely. It definitely <laughs> makes sense. Awesome. So do you have any last messages that you'd like to share with our audience today? <laughs> We'd love it if you watch our film. Yes. <laughs> Watch Love Heals the Documentary. I'll link the everything in the show notes to the film. Do you have any, I guess, what are your plans for the film now? Are you trying to distribute it mm. further? Yes. Do you want me to speak yeah. to that one? We'd love to hear. So one of my responsibilities this year is film distribution. So we're working with a very helpful marketing agency who also houses our film on the show and tell website. So it's like a beautiful landing page. We can do partnerships like we did with Lavender. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to continue finding partners to help us spread the film because our, you know, community is only so big and you can only market the film to that community so many times before they've all seen it. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, Korea and Japan are killing it. (laughs) They have so many thousands of people that have seen the film. They have like 400 screenings booked in Japan. It's insane. So you're saying your film is translated with subtitles. It is. is. So right now I think it's in 10 languages. At least 10 languages. Okay. That's amazing. That's Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But our goal, like our overall goal as a, as a team was to have 1 million people see the film by the end of this year. That mm. was just something we thought we would love to manifest. And in order to do that, it, it takes a lot of work and partnerships. Mm-hmm. You know, we have our social media platform for Love Heals Film. People find us and then they get really interested. And then if that person tells somebody else, tell somebody else, we're just, but it takes a lot of people to share about what we're doing and about the Mm -hmm. film and how it impacted them. And the other thing that we're doing to try to help that is creating a community. See, Love Love Heals isn't just a documentary. And we knew that. We could feel that as we were filming these sacred stories of healing. We thought if one person is inspired to do something different that's going to put them on a path to self-love and self-healing, that's a mission. Mm. It's a movement. Oh yeah. So what we're doing now is trying to create community. So it's no longer just about, oh, we want everybody to see the film. It's sure, we want as many people in this world to see the film as possible, but it's the impact that that is going to have on their lives and the lives around them. Yes. Because when I heal, people around me heal. Yeah. Relationships heal. Oh, yeah. Right. I'm showing up different. So everybody around me is going to have a different experience just based on my energy and how I'm showing up in the world. So we've started monthly gatherings over Zoom, uh, which we're super excited about. And, you know, a lot of people from your community came to the last one Mm -hmm. for a workshop. And we're just going to do stuff like that every month Mm -hmm. and hope that organically, as we create partnerships and continue to build community, that Love Heals becomes you know, as big as I believe it can and should be to help heal the planet and the people in it. So that's my hope. Wow. And I love that you, oh, sorry. Go ahead. (laughs) I was just going to say, I love, I love, and I want to just reiterate what you said about, um, it's, it's not about watching the film. I mean, of course we made a film. We'd love it if people watch it. And I know I was like, watch the film, but it's because I believe in the experience that people can have. I mean, every day Dana's getting messages from people literally all over the world about how watching the film confirmed something for them, or it's healing a part of them that they were unaware of, or it's helping them see something differently in their healing journey. And to me, that's everything. So it's like the impact is the experience of huh, maybe there is something to this self-love thing that I haven't (laughs) considered before. And what a beautiful time. I mean, this world is in so much chaos. Mm -hmm. What a perfect time to start to spread a little more love out there. And yeah, so at the end of the day, that's all, that's all it's about is helping people know that their value, we're worthy of love. I'm in that process myself, but we're worthy. Yes. 
I just want to say thank you for being such lights in this world, because Mm -hmm. I always say it's so beautiful to see. It really is a ripple effect of positivity. Like you are speaking your truth. You're sharing this mission that I feel like everybody on the planet can get behind, right? Self-love and self-healing. It almost feels, it is universal. I want to say it, and it's necessary. Like more people need to hear this message. And I, I hope that, you know, maybe somebody's listening to this podcast who can connect with you and help you spread the film even further further. I support you both all the way. And again, I feel like we're, we have the same mission. We share the same mission. Mm -hmm. And so we're just doing this together. (laughs) Well, I am grateful for you spreading your light. And I mean, just your support means everything. But I think back to the time we spent in your home and getting to know your pup. And I just, I'm just so grateful for what you're doing. And I'm sure there's many days it's not easy. Mm -hmm. I know that for myself. Being a content (laughs) creator is not easy. I know. (laughs) No, Eileen, I just love you and the work that you're doing to make your life, the people around you and the world a better place. It is the same mission. So anything that we can ever do to help you on your mission and vice versa, like this can be a long-term partnership in whatever ways that we can help people. That's the bottom line. Thank you so much. Amazing. Well, everybody make sure you check out the film Love Heals. This was Dana and Chrisanna. I'll share everything in the show notes and I love you both. Thank you so much for being on the show. We love you so much. much. (laughs) Thank you for this opportunity. Yes, it was beautiful. Thank you.